Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for the second in our four part winter webinar series. Many of you joined us this fall for our social media webinar, and due to the huge response that we received, we added a second webinar to provide a deeper dive into social media. My name is Jessica DeGraff, and I, along with my counterpart, Megan Owens, work with IGCs across North America. And essentially, our role is to work to support this critical segment of our industry with unique programs, marketing tools, and support mechanisms to make the Proven Winners brand really work for you at a very local level. Before we get started today, we wanted to share just a few housekeeping items with you. First and foremost, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. That being said, we absolutely love your participation, especially when we've got three great panelists that are available to answer your questions this afternoon. To communicate, you can either click on the chat icon or the Q&A icon, icon excuse me, to ask your questions to the panelists. Megan is going to be fielding all of the questions and we'll, we'll share those with the panelists during their sessions and also at the end of the webinar during our Q&A session. This webinar is being recorded and will be available by the end of the week for you to access again. All of our previous webinars have been recorded as well and can be accessed on the Proven Winners Retail YouTube page. And you can see the link at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, we're so excited to introduce you to our panel of social media experts. While all of our panelists come from varied backgrounds in the industry, they all have a wealth of knowledge of plants and social media that they're willing to share with you today. Our first panelist is Christina Howley. Christina manages social media for Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs and Spring Meadow Nursery. She draws knowledge from <clears throat> her personal garden and professional horticultural experience to share with home gardeners. Next, we have Susan Martiner of Gardener Sue's News. Susan is a freelance horticultural marketer, writer, speaker, and, based, and consultant based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She works with the Proven Winners marketing team to support the brand with their social media skills, copywriting, and plant knowledge. And over the past five years, she's managed our Instagram page. Joe Williams is an SEO and PPC specialist with Spring Meadow Nursery. Joe is an absolute wizard with analytics and is going to be sharing and answering key questions on the metrics you should be measuring and how to get the most out of your social media platforms. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Christina. All right, so hi there, everybody who I cannot see. Um, it's exciting to be able to talk to you a little bit about uh, Facebook. I, um, I think social media is such an awesome way to connect with home gardeners because that is its primary goal. It's social. Um, so when you are using it, you might find yourself being like, oh no, this is a business. I have to treat it like um, I'm only trying to send them ads. I'm trying to sell products. And I would say go with your, your first instinct. Um, to make the most out of Facebook, we have to realize and remember that people are going there because it's a social experience. Um, so when you are making your posts, when you're filling out your profile information, um, when you're interacting with it in any way, remember first that it's, it's there so that people can, um, can spend their time in a way that feels good and it doesn't just feel like they're sitting through commercials. Um, so first, a lot of you are wondering how to optimize your profile information. Um, that is going to be one of the biggest challenges that I think most people don't really uh, consider. And that's your voice. This is the place that you get to introduce yourself. Um, so if people are coming to your page, they want to know um, who you are and what your business is about. What are your intentions? So you have to decide what that voice is going to be. Start as you intend to go on. Um, when you have your profile information also, sorry, I meant to say on the last slide, there's a lot of information that you can put on Facebook and Facebook wants you to. So make sure that you have a great profile picture, that your header is clear, that if you have a button to lead to your website, that it's going somewhere useful. Um, all of that information is to help a, um, a user say, I have a question, here's the answer without having to like really dig for it. Um, so just make sure that you really fill that information out. Anyway, so with this uh, profile information, this is an example from our very own page, Proven Winners Color Choice um, Flowering Shrubs. Our intention was to show people, actually, this is not technically a business. It's just, a, it's the brand. It's, um, it's saying, 
hey, meet our plants here. And then they'll follow through to the garden center to get to know more about those plants. So that was part of our intention. Part of our voice is helpful and excited to share the joy of gardening with people. So that's how we approach our social media. That's our voice. Um, and when you write your about information, you can decide, am I going to have just hard facts? Am I, am I really using it just for a place to, to put our sales, to put um, like fun plant facts? Am I giving friendly advice? Hey, please uh, don't cut the top off of your arborvitae. That would be good. Um, or like, hey, this is how we take care of our plants and how we know that we're providing you the best possible plants. Here's a peek into our greenhouse. Um, or are you just on the social media on social media to connect with your customers about the beauty of plants? There are so many voices you can have, so many ways you can approach it. Um, but it's really important to use your profile information to to get that started. So the next um, the next point that I heard that you guys wanted to hear a lot about um, was copy and content creation. This is the meat and potatoes. This is probably one of the biggest, hardest uh, hills to climb uh, managing social media because it's all about the posts um, in a little bit. I'm gonna say what else it's about in a little bit, but it's about the posts. Uh, I watched last the last seminar with Stacy where she was talking about social media when I was on maternity leave. Um, so you've already heard a little bit about how she likes to create content and how she goes um, to face it. So you're going to hear a little bit of that, but I'm hoping to expand upon it a little bit more. Um, my first piece of advice is to try and plan ahead. Um, when you're working in the moment all of the time, that's exhausting. That is, that is decision fatigue. Um, if you're just trying to post every day uh, without any plan, then you might feel really overwhelmed and you might spend a lot more time developing a post than you would if you had worked ahead of it. So that's where a content calendar comes in. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to, to, to download any software to get started. Just write down, okay, these are some ideas that I have for the month and plop them in a day, just so that you have some information on there so that you're not making a decision every single day. Um, so that is the, the first part of what I would say Try and plan ahead um, so that you can, so that you're not working in the moment all the time. So when you're thinking, okay, what's my voice? Part of that is going to automatically say what you're gonna be posting about. If you're the hard facts person, then write a list of all the hard facts that you want your customers to know. And then literally post about those. Just break them down and make sure that they are getting each little bit of information with a beautiful photo. Uh, photos are priceless. They are, they're what drive likes um, pretty much over any platform. I manage Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn uh, posts get a much better <laughs> like if you're, if you're putting a picture on it. Um, so make sure that you're just developing those ideas with a photo in mind. Um, you can even keep a folder of inspirational pictures. So if you're feeling like your well is dry, go to that folder. You've got a pretty picture, like write a thing like, oh yeah, did you know that our, we water from the bottom up? And then you've got a beautiful photo for it. Boom, post. Um, because what it's about is posting regularly. So a calendar is saying every day is full. I'm posting every day. Um, so when you need something to just go up, a picture, just let it inspire you, boom, done. The next thing I'd like to consider when you're thinking about content creation um, is it's a great way to get your frequently asked questions to stop being frequently asked. Um, I also manage, I also help answer um, our feedback line. Um, so if you've ever been to Proven Learners and seen that we have a little thing on the bottom that says feedback, a lot of home gardeners write in and you can tell um, over the trend of a season people are writing in about a lot of the same things at this time of the year. So to help them not ask a lot of, to help your uh, customers or your audience not ask a lot of questions, post about it. Um, hey, a lot of you are wondering um, when, when's the best time to fertilize this? Or a lot of you are wondering when, if you should prune this. So 
post about it. And then people will think, oh, that is really helpful. I was wondering about that. I would like to know that. Um, and so that you can, you can help your sales team out, help your customer service team out by um, really lessening some of that contact. Um, I know that during the busy time, um, our customer service teams are just inundated with questions. So need a little bit of inspiration, go take a chat, go make a chat with them and say like, Hey guys, what are you, what are you hearing lately? Are you getting a lot of questions about things? Is there, um, maybe we could make a video of you guys answering the question so that people are seeing a professional, give them the question, um, the answer to their question. And last about content creation um, that Stacy I think did a good job of, of hitting um, when she pre presented was being in the moment. So that's a little bit counterintuitive to what I said about the content calendar. So when you're making themes and saying this month, I'm going to make sure that I talk about red plants, about the sales that we're having and about our, some of our behind the scenes stuff, make sure that you're leaving in a little wiggle room or if you are walking through a greenhouse and you see something beautiful, taking a picture of it and sharing it because you're a human being who likes things. You're trying to talk to human beings who like things. So probably they're gonna relate with what you're seeing and they'd like to see it too. Um, so that's a rough idea about content creation. Um, I think a lot of us get in our heads about what we would like to post, what we would like to see, but there's so much trial and error. Um, with content creation. Just, if you're thinking that it's a good idea, post it. And if it's a flop, it's a flop, but at least you know. Um, the next thing when you're thinking about content creation is lead conversions. So this was another question um, that Jessica and Megan shared with me that you guys were wondering about. We're on social media, yeah, 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 it's social. We're there to relate with people, all the fuzzy feelings, but in the end of it, we're paying somebody to post um, so that we do get sales, um, so that people are, are buying our products and that is fair. So what you're gonna do to make sure that you are getting con those, um, those lead conversions is making sure that you are, you're putting in call to actions. So that's not just, um, obviously for the post of the pretty picture, no call to action. It's just like, hey, look, I'm a human being who likes things, so are you. Um, that's building a connection. But the lead conversion part is the call to action. So that's learn more in this blog post where you're showing them, hey, we have this other great resource. We have a blog, uh, it has information or we have a newsletter, it's filled with great information. Go sign up for that, go look at that. Um, we're a resource, trust us. Um, or it could be, hey, see the plant bio. Um, if you have a website, I know 2020 uh, kind of forced a lot of people to create uh, websites that people would go and look at and spend some time at. So if you've got a website and a plant bio, send them to that plant bio. Um, if you've got a pretty picture of the plant, but you don't wanna put all of the information in that post, you've got a website for that. So send them to look at it. Um, it could be something as easy as read the reviews. So if you have a faithful customer base that leave reviews for you, share those and say, hey, go look here at these reviews um, because that is engaging your audience. It's saying, we're not just here to sell you things, but kind of that's what a call to action is. Um, but we're here to build a relationship. We're here to foster um, your confidence in us. And that can eventually lead to a sale. Um, so it's that's a huge thing when it comes to building content and creating content is to try and loop it back to what's the purpose of this post? Uh, if you find that you're mostly posting things that are in the moment but that don't have a call to action and you're not seeing a lot of return on investment when it comes to time you're spending on social media, that's probably why, um, is that people aren't saying like, oh yeah, like I could buy that plant from them if I just click on this website. So um, that's lead conversions. Joe is going to go way more into depth about, um, about uh, conversions, I'm sure, because he's he's putting things out on the internet about, uh, hey, come look at our plants, come look at our products. Um, and another thing that I would like to touch on, even though Joe, uh, our expert in house is gonna touch on it, is our insights. Um, if you go into Facebook insights, you probably, and you haven't been in there before, you're probably gonna be a little overwhelmed. There's a lot to see. 
Um, and not all of it is important every week. Um, it's nice to be able to keep your finger on the pulse when it comes to trends in how like how followers are starting to follow you throughout the season. So like, oh yeah, in springtime, we get a huge jump. Everybody's wanting to know um, about gardening and really engaging with gardening stuff, but it's a real drag in the winter. That's good to know. But I encourage you to check on your insights weekly um, because this is where you're seeing successes and failures. So post engagement is how often people are liking your post. Um, that's how often people are commenting or sharing. Um, I took these numbers from last week. So our engagement and our reach are pretty low just because the winter is not, um, not the time that a lot of people engage with our, our profile for gardening. But what I take a look at is the highs and the lows. So I want to know why I want to go and see like this day was really low. Like, so what post was that on that day? Um, what could I do better with a type of post that's like that? Oh, was it just informational? Was it a bad picture? Um, people don't like pictures like that or people don't want to have an article shared. So anyway, you're, you're looking into why was that a low day? Could I do anything to improve upon that? So you're not just um, constantly posting things that they don't like and don't respond to. Um, and then I also wanna pay attention to the, the high marks and say, wow, like that was the highest day. I wonder what it was. Was it just that it was a hot picture of a hydrangea? Because boy, do I have a tip for you. Um, if you just want like after like after like, just post hydrangeas because um, they're a surefire hit. Um, or was it something deeper? Did I really lock in on something that our, use, our, um, our audience is interested in? Do they love having gardening tips from Stacy? Like, wow, her videos are always a hit because she's relatable, funny, witty. She also feels like she's um, accessible, but an expert. So, or did a video that I did not do so well because I am like the Energizer Bunny and people can't keep up. Should I talk slower? things like that. So like you're really investigating um, why are things going well? Can I do more of, of that? Um, but not in kind of just like a copy and paste way, in an organic way. Um, I think last seminar, if you guys were watching, uh, Stacy shared a picture that she actually took that I shared of this these gorgeous at last roses in front of our office. Um, and everybody and their mother liked it. And we were like, okay, Hmm. So people just really like to see what's going on here. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do a lot of that this year because of the pandemic. We were all working from home, but it's good to know what kinds of things our users want to see so that we can give them more of that. Um, because when we do, it actually gets shared with more people. So the more people that engage with your post, um, the more likely Facebook is to share it with people. Uh, so that's just kind of one of those snowballs. Um, you're like, well, how can a lot of people see it? You just have to try and keep working at it, chip away. And then eventually when a lot of people see it, more people will see it. Um, so that's pretty much what I look at when it comes to insights um, to that. Facebook stories. So this is a relatively new thing. Um, Instagram is owned by Facebook. Facebook was like, hey, stories work well for Instagram. Let's try that here. Um, a lot of you were wondering what uh, is a good what is good to post about on uh, Facebook stories. So there are the things that I recommend posting on um, Facebook stories if you would like to post. Um, so content that isn't super successful in a post, something that isn't as aesthetically pleasing but is very like good to have knowledge wise. Um, it's still nice to share those things. Um, an expansion of a a post that you just did. So if you posted a picture of this gorgeous aronia, you might want to then post on your story uh, what its spring flowers look like or what its fall color looks like or um, what it looks like in a, in a garden with mostly annuals or perennials. So you're really um, taking that post and expanding it in the, in, in the stories. And then I would also say content that you've created on other platforms. So if you've got an Instagram or if you've got a TikTok or if you've got a Pinterest, um, this is a good place to post that stuff. And so that people know that you're also there. 
Um, so if they see like, oh, is that a little TikTok video? I'm on TikTok. I'm gonna go look at your your um your profile so that you can kind of show your followers. I'm posting other cool stuff over here. Go look at that too. Um, and then it just furthers your engagement. Um, that's really the the use that I see for Facebook stories. Um, also, stories show up at the top of somebody's profile, uh, whereas your post may never show up on their profile um, because. Facebook uses an algorithm where they want people to see the things that matter to them. And no offense, but businesses are pretty low on the totem pole sometimes. Uh, so uh, sometimes your followers, only about 2% of them might actually see your post. Uh, and that's because Facebook wants people to have a, a more social experience with like their friends and loved ones uh, and they're good pal proven winners. So we're trying um, to get in there as much as possible. Stories are a fun way to maybe wiggle our way in and say, hey, look at this thing. Um, and before I take any questions, there are a couple other things that I would want to mention that didn't really fall into the category. Um, last session, Susan mentioned that she uses a scheduler. And I recommend that like with both hands, like please do this. If you can use a scheduler, um, I'm begging you, it will make your life so much easier. Uh, and that's because it takes the burden off of having to go to, to, to go and figure out a post every single day. You can actually just use your schedule, scheduler like a content calendar. Um, and it'll just whip that post up. Also, if you find out, hey, 6 a.m. posts do really well, but you don't personally want to post at 6 a.m., this is a good way to do it. Um, speaking as a person who has posted at 6 a.m., it's better just not to do that. Um, and your schedule will, your scheduler will almost certainly come with a newsletter because they are a business. They want to help you, like you want to help other people. Um, they, their newsletter will probably be full of helpful things with uh, tips that could benefit you. So give them a chance. Um, read the newsletters, see if they're helpful, because it's a nice way to get information without having to do hours worth of work um, researching it yourself. Um, I know personally, it is tough to wade through and find a reliable source about what's, um, what's the best, I don't know, angle to take a picture at. Not that, that was a bad example. Um, what is the best time to post if you're not going to provide, you're not going to buy a service that tells you the time to post. Um, some of these schedulers will just recommend uh, stuff like that to you. Last, respond to the comments. Respond to the comments, respond to the comments, respond to the comments. Um, if people are taking time to engage with you, um, at least like the comment uh, because they're reaching out and they are, I mean, they might not know it, but that's like, that's building a relationship. You're saying, hey, you thought I was important enough to comment on? I think you're important enough to put a little smiley face at, thanks. Um, that's social networking. That's letting somebody know that you're a person behind a logo. So that's it. I went a little bit over, I'm sorry. I'm ready for my questions. <laughs> Great, thank you, Christina. We actually do have um, quite a few questions that came in. Um, a couple of them, I think, were related more to the Facebook stories, and you may have answered them, but I, I just want to make sure that we're completely answering the question for, for Lisa, who asked. Um, so it sounds like you're saying that there's a place for both posts and stories, and you don't kind of, you look at them as kind of having two separate purposes, and it's great to be using both of them, but it's not a, a one or another type of scenario in your mind, am I, am I stating that correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, the other question that was asked kind of in that same realm um, was when your Facebook and your Instagram are linked, um, often people are sharing the same things on both Facebook and Instagram. And, and is that okay? Should they be sharing different things on different platforms? Is, I mean, they may be reaching different customers who depending on how the customer engages. So Okay. Um, what's your suggestion there? Oh man, uh, do we have another seminar scheduled or is this, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I would say um, gently, I would not post the exact same thing from Instagram to Facebook. Um, I would say if you've got a really great idea and a beautiful picture, um, 
try to use them both and on both uh, platforms, but maybe just say uh, for Instagram, I'm going to post it on Tuesday, the 10th, but on Facebook, I'm going to post it on Friday, the 25th. Um, so that you, if people follow you in both places, they're not going to be like, Hey, this is not worth it to me. I don't want to see that same thing in two places. Um, and there are differences in the engagement. Um, so there are differences, just tiny little differences you might make in your voice from Instagram to Facebook. Uh, Instagram, we have um, people who like more flowery language. They want to be hyped up. They want to hear how gorgeous this dazzling hydrangea is in this, the summertime breeze. Like, but on Facebook, they might actually just want to know, hey, this is full sun. You've got terrible soil. OK, this is fine. Um, so I would recommend, yes, you can use the content, um, but please, like try to rework the text. Don't post it on the same day. Um, and if you are using an Instagram story and you want it to just post to Facebook, be careful with that because um, if you're using like buttons or uh, surveys, they don't work on Facebook. So people will be like, I don't like looking at that story because I can't do anything with it. Okay, great, that's great advice. Um, we've had a couple questions come in asking, is there a scheduler that you use that you'd recommend? Um, just looking for a little bit of guidance there. Yeah, so I personally use Buffer. I like Buffer um, because it was the cleanest. Um, I personally like it when a website is easy to look at, and this is that. It's also not expensive. Um, you can manage a couple of profiles for relatively inexpensive and I don't want to quote a price because I don't know it but um, it's pretty cheap so that's the one I use and it manages the most platforms it manages Facebook Instagram LinkedIn and Twitter probably another one that I don't use but um, that's what I use okay and somebody did ask kind of as a follow-up to that if um they had thought that Facebook didn't give um, high access to outside schedulers, like it would be better to use a Facebook scheduler. Have you run into that at all or? No, okay. I buffer posts like unfailingly. If you do have a video, um, I would recommend uploading that directly to Facebook and scheduling it because Facebook does allow you to schedule videos. So a video you'd get to choose your, um, your thumbnail, you'd get to put your, um, captions on and through a scheduler you almost certainly can't do that so that's the one exception that i would say okay um we had another question and we'll probably have to um save some of these questions <laughs> towards the end because they're coming in fast and furious but um another question was just on um how often you're posting whether that be how many times a day how many times a week but just to be to have effective engagement i think we touched on this a little bit in the last webinar but quickly i mean is there you know kind of a tried and true that you you would suggest as far yes. as the amount of times you're posting once i would say once a day um i would it's more posts than that are probably going to get your posts seen less uh, than more Actually, no, probably, no. They would get your post soon less. Okay. Great, great, that's great information. Like I said, we have a couple more that we'll, we'll uh, save for the end, but in the interest of time, we probably should, should move on there. So thank you, Christina, I really appreciate it. It's great information. Okay, are we ready to talk about Instagram? All right, here we go. Well, here's the good news. A lot of what Christina just said applies to Instagram. So you've already learned half of what you need to know. <laughs> I'm just gonna talk about a few different things in addition to that. So if, if you haven't yet, please go back and look at that first social, we, uh, social media webinar. It had tons of information, including names of scheduling services, um, you know, difference between pages and stories and all that kind of content. A lot of the things that are being asked are in that first webinar. So please go back and, and um, watch that. On today's, um, we are gonna talk more about engagement. I'm gonna talk specifically about why it's critical and how to get more of it um, and define exactly what it is for you. We're gonna be talking about really specifically what to put in your captions, what kinds of photos to use on Instagram that work best. 
Uh, we will talk about optimizing your bio like Christina did. There's some different tips on Instagram um, than there is on uh, Facebook. Um, we did talk about hashtags a little bit last time, but we're going to talk very specifically about which hashtags to use and what kinds in all of your posts. posts and we're going to talk about contests today. All right, so here's the bad news. Instagram was not built for your business. They were not built to help you increase your sales. Instagram is there to build community among its members and to bring more members into that community. And all of those members bring in more members and all those people tend to buy the things that their advertisers are selling. So that, that's, how, um, that's, how, that's the motivation behind Instagram itself. But knowing that we can craft our content in a way that re, um, brings in more engagement. Because like Christina said, this is supposed to be a social exper uh, experience. Gardening is fun, right? I mean, that's what social pe people are on social media to have fun and to entertain themselves. So you are there to entertain, you're there to serve your customer, you're there to inspire, educate and relate to them and um, build that community. And by talking with the people who are um, responding to your post and interacting with your posts. So if you do all those things well, you will naturally sell without ever asking them to buy a thing. And that has been, those four pillars have been our um, mantra on Instagram for the last five years. Um, we have spent very, very little on paid posts and advertising on Instagram. Almost all of what you see is organic, um, unpaid reach. Um, and that was gained by serving, inspiring, educating, and relating. Very, uh, not very often will you find us saying, hey, come buy our stuff. So, um, so, so why should you, why should you, you know, even try and work on your engagement? Okay, so there's a few reasons and um, some will benefit your social media and some will actually benefit your actual store. So when you are listening and engaging with your audience on Instagram, you're learning about what they like, what they don't like, what their pain points are. And all of those things help you identify future content you can create, craft for your Instagram page, but it also can help you inform how what you buy to sell in your store and how to sign your store to address those pain points that people are telling you on your Instagram that they have. So everybody on your Instagram is talking about the drought that you guys are in and they come into your store then and see um, a, a end cap signed with drought tolerant. Here's, you know, Oklahoma's drought busters and an end cap, they're going to be like, hey, you know, I saw that on Instagram. They're paying attention and maybe they don't think that consciously, but subconsciously they're you're starting to build that trust and credibility. The more you are listening to your customers and talking with them, answering their questions and posting more about what they want to hear. <clears throat> Next. So what what is engagement? What counts as engagement? Uh, Instagram counts engagement as basically any kind of interaction that someone takes with your post. So if they tap the heart to like it, if they share it, if they comment on it, they save it. If they click the link uh, that says more to read the rest of your caption, if they swipe through a carousel of pictures, um, all of those things count as engagement. So you can see that's, a, that's an insight um, from a post we did a couple weekends ago. We asked a question in the post and about 2,600 people liked it, 268 people commented on it, three people shared it, and 64 people saved it. Every one of those actions counted as engagement. And Instagram's algorithm saw that and said, hey, hmm, a lot of people are liking this post. A lot of people are commenting on it. I'm going to show it to more people because obviously it's interesting. So without paying you know, to have our post seen by more people. Um, Instagram rewarded our engagement by showing our post to 52,818 people without paying a dime. So was that worth you know, me answering and responding to 268 questions? It was, because that was priceless. We couldn't have paid, we would have paid hundreds of dollars to reach um, uh, on just this one post to reach that many people. Um, Notice also down on the very bottom, 
it says uh, from hashtags, 4,282 people discovered that post through hashtags. So I'm just going to point that out because we are going to talk about hashtags more. And uh, that is proof right there of why you need to use hashtags. One more thing is um, I had to put it in here somewhere. So I remember to tell you, don't post in ghosts. So Instagram knows when you are on Instagram, it knows if you post something at 6 a.m. and then don't come back onto Instagram until 12 hours later to answer questions. If you post and then don't come back to your page again multiple times during the day, even if it's just to open the app, go to your page and close the page, it will um, show your post to fewer people because it thinks you are not managing your page, you're not paying attention to your customers and your followers. So it's going to dock you for that. So anytime you get a spare second, just open the app, go to your page, check on if there's anyone who's asked the question in the last couple of few hours and respond. Like Christina said, always, always respond. Um, so what should you post about generally speaking? Um, unfortunately, what I see a lot out there is 75% promotional content and 25% educational and inspirational should be the opposite ratio. You are there to educate, to inspire, to share, to learn with your customers, to help them. Um, and like I said, when you do those things, you will sell. Now, that's not saying you can't ever say, hey, we're having a sale on Saturday. About 25% of the time, you can say that directly. But the more, you, the more promotional, strictly promotional content you put out there, on Instagram without paying to have it seen, uh, the more Instagram will dock you because promotional content usually has very low engagement numbers and low engagement posts get shown to very few people. So what kinds of photos um, are most engaging? So these are the types of, uh, these are some categories of photos that tend to get higher engagement on Instagram. So photos with bold colors, um, photos with a clear focal point and blurred background, you can get that using the portrait mode on your iPhone if you shoot your photos um, like that. Uh, flat lay is a picture where you're looking straight down like on that, um, that picture of chips and salsa there. Pictures of people and especially animals tend to get higher engagement, more people tend to interact with those posts. Um, posts where that, that show perspective, like that field of salvia there, where you're looking into the picture, people tend to, their eye tends to linger longer into those pictures. And when you linger longer on a picture, Instagram is tracking that, of course, and they give you more, more points for that. Um, and pictures that show movement. So you can see that hasta we down there is just emerging in the spring. And that was a carousel post. So you had to swipe to see the picture of the full grown plant. So of course that helped our engagement when people swiped. All right, so now that we've got an eye catching photo, what do we put in the actual caption? So here are some specific tips on how to write great captions in Instagram. Um, first, remember only the first two lines of your caption show in your post. You have to tap the little more button to actually expand the whole caption which I can tell you do, a lot of people do not do because they ask you all kinds of questions about the stuff you've written in the line four, five, and six of your caption. But you know that's part of the job is answering those questions. Um, so make the first sentence or the first line catchy because you wanna catch their attention to when they're scrolling through Instagram um, at lightning speed like they do. Um, emojis help to capture their attention in the first line or two. Um, and just some kind of fun text like dreaming of rainbows of coral bells on this chilly December morning with a rainbow. Um, that caught people's attention. So um, this post um, had 2000 likes. It probably had about 20,000, 25,000 reach, I'm guessing. Um, tell them they can't, something they can't see in the picture. Uh, how boring is it to have someone show you a picture of pink flowers and say, hey, these are pink flowers. Like, yeah. I didn't need you to tell me that. <laughs> I can see that. Tell me something I don't know, right? To make it more interesting. So here we gave them the names of the plants. Always give the names of the plants unless you want to answer that question 42 times in your question and your in your answers there or your your um, comments. Um, tell them how to grow it. You know, heart shade, filtered sun, well-drained soil, 
average moisture. Here's what zone. Always, if it's a perennial or a shrub, we always put the zone. Um, and you know, give a tip or give something valuable. There's um, go to the next slide and you'll see another post. So here's this is the same text on the on the left here. We're going to show you three different examples. So here's an example. Right before Fourth of July weekend, I wrote a, a simple post with a picture of people watering, saying, "Hey, you going out of town? You know, don't forget to water because you don't want your plants to be toasted. You know, when you get home because." We know that happens, you know, this is how garden centers sell replacement hanging baskets after the 4th of July weekend, right? So, um, you know, I can't tell you how many people responded like, oh my gosh, thank you so much, I almost forgot. So uh, how, that was a helpful tip. Next, um, and the next one was a summerific tip, uh, week tip we gave when we gave some, a little bit of education about how the purple pigment in the leaves of a hibiscus develop um, they need UV light. So if you bought them in a greenhouse from a greenhouse and the leaves were green, when you put them outside, they will turn purple if the leaves are supposed to be purple. I don't know how many people said, oh my gosh, I thought the plant was mismarked because it has had green leaves and I didn't know. So again, we're just teaching people uh, about the plants um, and, and people want to tune in because they feel like they're learning how to garden on our page. And not too many other people are teaching them that, especially other brands are not. Optimizing your bio. Okay, so this is an example of your bio on the top of your Instagram page. So you'll notice here, of course, it had there. Um, here's two examples: Tonkadale um, Greenhouse in Minnesota, Swanson's in Seattle. Um, your uh, your bio should answer who, what, where, and give a link. So who are you? Okay, I'm a, your greenhouse ho home. I'm your local garden center, owned since 1924. You know, we're always approachable here. We're here to help you with indoor and outdoor gardening. Um, here on Tonkadales, they have put hashtags. So if, you, if they're telling their fans, their followers, if you wanna tag us in your post on stuff you got at Tonkadale, tag hashtag Tonkadale and hashtag your greenhouse home. And you can search those hashtags to find other posts um, that were um, made with using those hashtags. Uh, Tonkadale just used a link to their um, their straight website homepage. Swanson's had switched their um, link out on that particular day for a blog that they had posted a picture of a snake snake plant, and they changed their link that day to be a link to their snake plant blog. Um, so here are a couple more with some different things in their bio. So still answering the who, what, where, and the link. But um, Sky Nursery, you'll see, used a Linktree link instead of their um, skynursery.com. And Arts Nursery used the link in bio. Um, so those are two services you can use to provide um, a, a set of links on your Instagram. The, the downside I see of Instagram is they don't allow you to put a link in every post. And if you don't have more than 10,000 followers, they don't let you put a link in your story. So you need to craft another way to link people to what you want them to see. So using a service like Linktree or LinkedIn bio, LinkedIn bio or Curalate is another one that we will be switching to soon. Um, these are paid services that allow you to link to more than one thing. And the next slide will show you what you get when you click on those links. So a Sky Nursery, the link tree, it's about $6 a month for that service. When you click that link in their profile, it takes you to this um, set of blocks. You can change the color of the blocks if you want. Um, and those are like the top seven topics of the week that they have been talking about. And you can change those out throughout the week. Um, or you can change, you know, change them once a month, however, however often you want to change them. Um, those coordinate with the topics you are talking about on your Instagram. So Linktree doesn't give you pictures, it gives you text boxes. Link in bio on the right um, will let you use pictures and it'll let you link to any place on the internet you want to go. Um, Curalate looks similar. Curalate is one that's used by the New York Times and it's one that we will be switching to, it looks like, um, soon. We actually hired a new social media consultant ourselves um, at Proven Winners to help us do a better job um, with our own social media and they are going to be helping with us with things like um, improving our link in bio. So here's just a couple of 
options you have. Okay, hashtags. So um, hashtags are essentially like file folders. Uh, the way people search content on Instagram is by searching hashtags. So let's say I'm someone who has deer in my garden and I wanna know more about deer resistant plants. I can search the hashtag deer resistant and if I find 5,900 posts um, that are about deer resistant plants. So hashtags are something, remember on that first post, that uh, earlier slide it showed like 4,300 people had found our post through one of the hashtags that we had put in our post. So that was free people we brought to our page just by using, you know, hashtags. So what kinds of hashtags should you use? Um, I keep a sheet of them right next to my computer of ones that have worked for us in the past. Basically, you should have popular, moderately popular, niche specific, and branded hashtags in every post. You can use up to 30. We use usually somewhere between 10 and 20. That's not a, there's no magic number there. Uh, basically, you wanna use some, po some hashtags that have a lot of, of um, people uh, posting them and some that have fewer. All, but all of them should relate somehow to what you're actually picturing in that particular post. The last set down there was the branded hashtags. A lot of people have asked me about how do I get a hashtag for my own business? So you'll notice on every ha um, post that Proven Winners puts on Instagram, we ha use hashtag Proven Winners as the first hashtag in every, for every single post. And we always put our hashtags in comment number one because it keeps our um, actual caption looking cleaner. So Sky Nursery can use Sky Nursery or Tonkadale, you know, or that your greenhouse home would fall into this category that Tonkadale had come up with as their own branded hashtag. This is something you make up. You can decide it on your own. I made up those last four. Um, and those last couple are, are ways to get more local people to find your business. So Pittsburgh Gardens or Gardening in Miami are two hashtags I just made up. If I was a garden center, you know, in those um, areas, I would start using that hashtag in every one of my posts. Um, and then when someone starts searching the word Pittsburgh in um, their for hashtags, Pittsburgh Gardens will come up and they can find you that way. So that's one way to dial all the pe everyone in the world who can follow you on Instagram down to your city level to get more people into your store. Okay, the last thing we're talk gonna talk about is contests. So contests are like a shot in the arm, a, way, a quick way to get a whole bunch of new followers. Um, so we, view, we use them a few times a year. We don't use them super often because then we, that just looks spammy. Um, but we try and do something meaningful when we hold a contest. And the goal is to build our number of followers, it's to um, bring new people onto our page um, and it's also just to kind of show the fun side of um, our brand and our, our business. So when we hit 100,000 followers uh, last year, we did a contest. I was like, wow, notice emojis that catch people's attention in the first line there. Uh, and we are so thankful for you, you know, who helped get. And so what we did was we gave away two gift certificates. Um, one was to the person who entered the contest and the other was for a special healthcare worker or frontline worker in their life that they posted about in the caption, so in the comments. So um, we asked people to leave a short story um, about a healthcare worker or frontline worker in their life and why and tag them um, in that comment. And um, we had to pick one. We ended up picking two, I think, <laughs> because um, there were so many this gut wrenching stories that people left. You can imagine during uh, the pandemic, how many 596 people left a comment on that post wanting to enter. Um, so that built a lot of goodwill towards our company. Um, we got a whole bunch of new followers from doing that. Um, and it made us feel good for doing something good for our own community, right? So we want to show we're part of the community. We understand what we're all going through. And here's a little something to make your day brighter. Uh, just make sure when you do an Instagram contest, you follow Instagram's rules. They're not real big, but you notice at the end there, we did the required fired, uh, fine print. You know, we're not sponsored endorsed, administered by Instagram. Instagram's not liable, you know, the 
CYA language, I call it, the legalese. So anyway, that's a quick, quick way to build um, a bunch of followers. So it's a lot. There's a lot to learn on Instagram. There's a lot to learn on Facebook, but keep at it. Um, keep following. Um, follow Proven Winners page, Instagram page. Uh, if we get less than a thousand more followers today, we'll have 3,500 or 135,000 followers today on Instagram. So I'm hoping y'all sign up. Y'all you know, like our page. Anyway, there are tons of there's tons of free information, webinars, and classes like that about Instagram online. Uh, Jen's Trends is a good one. You can watch her YouTube videos or follow her on Instagram. So keep learning. It's worth the effort. Great. Thanks, Susan. We had a couple quick questions for you. Um, one was as far as length of post. Do you have, uh, is there suggestions on when they get a little bit, the copies too much or, or not enough or what's kind of the guidance there? Sure, yeah, that, I've actually looked a lot into that and our social media analyst has looked into that because I tend to be wordy. <laughs> and um, it actually turns out that our longer posts um, receive more engagement than our short posts. So that just goes to show that people get that we are there, like we're posting a lot because we're trying to teach you something about a particular plant. And like, if we're talking about hydrangeas and how to prune them, takes a lot of words to tell, teach people the right thing <laughs> when you do that. So um, basically take as many words as you need, but not any more than you need. And right. try to vary up your captions. So some are short and some are longer. Great, that's great advice. Um, another question was um, using uh, Instagram Live um, and if, if that's something that we do very often and really how you've seen businesses successfully incorporate using Facebook Live, um, I mean, excuse me, Instagram um, Live in their feeds. I've seen businesses have more success doing that with Facebook Live than Instagram Live. Um, Instagram, people tend to come and go very quickly from Instagram. They're not really there to watch your 10 minute video. Um, they're more likely to go to YouTube or Facebook Live to watch that. Um, live video can work if you advertise that you are going to be doing a live video um, and you post ahead of time several days in advance. Make sure you turn tune in at three o'clock on Wednesday when we do this, because otherwise, if you don't let them know it's coming, you're just subject to who happens to be online that at that particular moment you start your live video, which is going to be far fewer people than if you would have advertised it. Right. No. Awesome. That's great advice. Thanks, Susan. And also don't ever use your same content on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> Someone asked that. Yes, you can use um, similar pictures and, and the theme can be similar, but your audiences are not the same on Instagram and Facebook. And um, keep in mind, Instagram and Facebook, they, they, the algorithms show about 2% of your actual followers, your posts. So the likelihood that someone happens to follow you on both Instagram and Facebook and is online on the same day at the same time, looking at the same posts in their newsfeed that just happened to come up, they're part of that 2% that um, the algorithm actually showed your post is minuscule. So um, don't worry about that, but, um, but make sure you are targeting your audience specific with your, with your information on Facebook. We don't, we're not all about education. We're about watching Laura videos and posting feel good inspiration. On Instagram, we do more of the education um, and interaction type stuff. So the post should not be the same. And yes, it does take more work and it, yes, it's worth it. Great, thanks Susan. We're gonna turn it over to Joe to talk a little bit about analytics. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. So my name is Joe Williams. I do SEO, PPC, and within that, a lot of like social media analytics, data management, all sorts of things like that um, at Spring Meadow Nursery. Um, so 
within the time we have today, it's not, you know, enough time to show you how to like set up every analytics thing perfectly or do anything like that. But I hope to be able to give you guys some ideas on like the kind of data you want to collect, what to think about with that data, as well as to kind of use the thing Facebook already gives you that are super easy to access to hopefully improve your social media performance. Um, so there's a couple different tools we can use to do that. Um, the first one is something called the Facebook Pixel. Um, you use that on your website and Facebook will basically track anyone who has a Facebook account anytime they come to your website and give you more information than you should probably be allowed to have um, from an ethics standpoint on um, who those people are, what they do on their website, and what they do on Facebook. Um, it's a little difficult to set up if you don't have coding background, um, but there's no way I could give you a better tutorial on it than you'll get by just typing Facebook Pixel into Google, clicking the first thing, and following their instructions. Um, if you don't have a website and you can't set that up, you don't need to worry. There are plenty of um, other ways you can get data from Facebook, but if you do have a website, I'd recommend into looking into setting this up, getting on your website, and at least letting it be there and collect data, even if you don't have time right now to actually do anything more with it. Um, the second thing is the data within Facebook. Christina touched on insights a little bit earlier, um, but I'm going to go over it. Again, insights are basically all the data Facebook collects on things that happen within your Facebook page or on your Facebook posts. Um, so when you go and look in there, you're going to see a lot of different numbers on like post engagement, reach, how often people clicked on things, all sorts of things like that. And what you really need to do when you go in there is decide what's important to you. What's your business's goal on Facebook? What are you trying to do when you post on Facebook? And then decide from there, which of these metrics actually matter to you. We've talked a lot today about reach and post engagement, which as Susan and Christina both noted, it's how you get seen on Facebook. And for that matter, pretty much any social media. They really want people to be engaging with their website and their brand. So really what matters to them is how often people are engaging. So with that in mind, when you're doing all of these posts that, you know, promote people engaging with your brand, whether it's a giveaway, whether it's a Q&A, or whether, you know, it's just a nice plant where you ask people to share, you know, what's your favorite hydrangea or what's your favorite butterfly bush, um, all sorts of posts like that, you really want to pay attention to your engagement rate and what that means for you. Like Christina said, you know, if you post a hydrangea, you're going to get a ton of engagement. So you need to be able to look at your engagement rate and say, oh, you know, this post had a hydrangea on it. The engagement is good. This post didn't have a hydrangea. Engagement is still good as a hydrangea post. You know, why is that? Um, and ultimately, that's kind of your goal within the Insights tab. It's not to sit there and get overwhelmed at every single option. You know, it's not there to look at some of the more, you know, vanity metrics that, that don't really matter. You'll see, you know, things in there like how many people have viewed one of your videos for three seconds. It's nice to know that people are clicking on your videos, but if I had to guess, most videos aren't covering the message you want people to see in the first three seconds of the video. The last option here is something kind of similar to Facebook Pixel called Google Analytics. Um, if you have a website, the company that built your website probably set it up um, when they built your website. It'll track anything and everything happening on your website. And it's another good way to know, you know, how many people are actually clicking on my links and making it to my website from Facebook or from Instagram. You know, and when they get to my website, are these people buying things or do they just like to look around? Um, probably the biggest social media insight we've gotten from Google Analytics at Spring Meadow. Um, is looking at Pinterest users. You know, we get a ton of users from Pinterest on a number of our different sites, but Google Analytics gives us the capability to see, okay, you know, this year we got 50,000 visitors on our website from Pinterest, but none of them bought anything. You know, so then we looked into to why that is, and it, well, why do people go to Pinterest? It's not because they're shopping, it's because they're just looking for inspiration. Pinterest is the place you go when you want to buy a house next year, or you want to plant a garden in six months, you know, and you want ideas for what should be in that garden, or ideas for what your new kitchen should look like in your house, and it's really not for things you're buying today. So you can use that information to, you know, inform what kind of posts you make on the platform, inform all sorts of different things you do within social media. Um, the next thing I wanted to get to here is targeting on social media. This is probably the most overwhelming part of doing paid advertising on social. When you go to make a paid post, whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on Instagram, um, you'll have all these different options for how to target different people on these platforms. Um, 
Facebook's built-in audiences give you a ton of different options to target people based on their interests, what kind of pages they like, um, things like how old they are, gender, basically any sort of demographic info you can think of is there. Um, and given that you've been running your business for probably a while, you generally know who your customers are, how old they are, if they're more male or female, things like that. So that's a good place to start for targeting your audience. Um, there are also some other options that I think are useful and let you get into kind of a more advanced um, targeting capabilities. It's not something I can fully teach in 20 minutes, but it is something I would implore you to kind of look into on your own, especially if you just have time and want to read. There are millions of blogs out there about how to target people on Facebook with custom audiences. Um, another big one, which seems super simple and super easy, but um, catches me in a mistake a lot of the time is location-based targeting. Um, you only want to target people in spots where they can actually, you, uh, you know, purchase from your business. If you're a local greenhouse that only serves the the Grand Haven area in Michigan, you don't want to be targeting people in Chicago, you know. But if you're a D2C company and you're willing to ship all over the 48 continental states, then your location targeting should be different. It's always worth checking and making sure you're targeting the right location, as well as expanding and contracting, uh, you know, the size of your location, maybe based on the time of year or based on other environmental factors. You know, if you hear other greenhouses in the area are low on stock, maybe it's time to expand that location and try to get people to drive from further to come see your, see your garden center. Um, another thing I always recommend when you're doing audience targeting on social media is to think outside the box. It's super easy to just target people who are interested in gardening or interested in plants. But something else you want to think about is what are people who are interested in gardening and interested in plants also interested in? And can I reach them in other ways? Something we have found to be super successful here is targeting people who are interested in pet adoption. For whatever reason, there's a big overlap between people who like to adopt pets and people who like to garden. So by targeting people who you know, are interested in pet adoption instead of people who are interested in gardening, we can find maybe a new audience that for whatever reason hasn't indicated to Facebook that they like gardening yet, or just, you know, is interested in pet adoption and maybe they're likely to become a gardener but haven't become a gardener yet. And so by, you know, thinking in creative ways and not always kind of just following the same plan you've been using for the last couple of years, you can find new audiences and help grow that page because at the end of the day, to keep increasing your reach, you need to keep finding new ways to reach gardeners. One last thing to, to think about in that spot, if we can go back real quick, sorry was um, audience exclusions. Facebook and Instagram will also give you the option to exclude people from seeing your ads, which is great, especially if you work at a larger company from keeping your employees from costing you money for clicking on your ads. You can exclude people based on where they work on some social medias. You can also exclude based on IP address or location to make sure that people in your office building don't cost you 20 bucks a day clicking on your ads to get to your website. No, I'm budgeting. This is probably the biggest question, often the hardest to answer question, um, you know, I get on a daily or even more frequently than that basis a lot of the time. How much money should we actually be spending when we want to promote a post on social media? And the answer I always give, and it's always irritating, is it really depends. So here are kind of the things I like to think about when I'm going to, you know, actually solve the it depends part of the budgeting problem. How big is the audience you want to target? Are you a D2C brand that's looking to target everyone who gardens in the continental US? Or, you know, are you a local garden center who doesn't see people from more than maybe 10 miles away? And you know your budget will change a lot based on that. The larger the audience is that you want to target, whether it be via location or some other way you've segmented your audience, the more money you're going to need on a daily basis. Another thing to think about is what you actually want your ads to do. Facebook, Instagram, and most other social medias allow for you to pay based on conversion actions. So essentially, they let you pay based on people achieving what you want them to achieve. Um, for us, a lot of the time, that's just an engagement. Um, so when you're targeting based on engagement, you can pay for engagements pretty cheaply and your budget doesn't need to be as big because Facebook loves keeping people on their website and they will show your ads to people very cheaply if you're not using your ads to get people off of Facebook. Um, so there are a couple different techniques you can use to do this, you know, where if you're running ads for likes or if you want to collect emails, Facebook has options to run ads that let people never leave their website. In scenarios like that, your budget can be a lot lower than when you're running an e-commerce campaign and want people to come buy things off your website. Um, 
That being said, you really never know until you try. Facebook will give you, you know, projections. Instagram will give you projections on what they think, how much you spend and what it'll do. But ultimately you don't know until you spend the money and you actually see the real world results. So it's important to, you know, set a budget that you're comfortable spending at the start and then be willing to adjust. The big benefit of digital marketing and digital advertising is that you can be so nimble. You can change your budget three times a day if you want. You can change your location and the audience you target every 20 minutes if you think you need to be changing that frequently. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's an option you have. And when you compare that to traditional advertising where you're buying you know, media placements six months in advance and they're locked in, it's really important to take advantage of this different competitive advantage over traditional media. All right, and then on Instagram, we'll, again, this is similar to what I've already talked about. Instagram, Facebook, as we mentioned earlier, both owned by Facebook. They try to keep things very similar. Again here though, it's really important to think about location and audience targeting and make sure you're actually getting people that want to see your ads. It's also, in my experience, more effective to do sort of shorter term Instagram campaigns. It's something we use a lot for shrub madness. When we're building out the bracket, you'll probably get the ads in a couple of weeks when we start uh, pushing plants out that way. Um, but the idea is to run ads that feel timely. You know, when you see the ad, you don't want it to be an ad from two months ago. And you see all, the last comment re, like that the account owner replied to was three weeks ago. You know, it looks dead. It looks like the guy doing my job said it two months ago and, and, you know, is now just sitting at home watching Netflix. So, you know, keeping the ads updated, keeping them regular and making it feel more like a regular post that you would come across on Instagram instead of, you know, an ad that was set two months ago and forgotten about, helps people feel like they're actually engaging with real content instead of sort of a faceless brand or a faceless marketing company. Um, something else I would mention about Instagram advertising is it's really be built for people who don't have advertising experience. It's super easy to go in within the Instagram app on your phone and figure out how to boost a post. All the, the audience targeting settings, location targeting settings are super easy and intuitive to use on the platform. And I would definitely recommend playing around with it and just getting some experience seeing what it's like. You can advertise for as little as $5 a day on Instagram. And while I wouldn't recommend it, I think you know it can be a good experiment to, to set an objective, set aside a hundred bucks and see what you can do with that advertising. So when it comes time to you know do a giveaway and promote your page to help grow followers, you have that experience and you have an idea of what promoting that post actually looks like. Um, and it's something we've used at Spring Meadow to help grow our various um, Facebook and Instagram page followings by a lot over the last year. Um, and then one other thing um, that we, I was told we wanted to touch on for this webinar is selling on Instagram um, as far as like selling natively within the platform. It's something that I think comes up a lot. It's something that Instagram and Facebook themselves are really enthusiastic about getting people on board with, but it's something I think I would recommend thinking about if it's right for you. Um, ultimately, setting it up isn't super easy. There are essentially two easy ways to do it. Um, one is building out a product feed, which would be a huge Excel spreadsheet with all your product info, uploading that to Facebook, and then letting Facebook kind of build you like a little mini inside Facebook store um, to showcase your products that way. It's something we've experimented with a bit and ultimately is something given the time and effort it takes to set up, I wouldn't recommend it unless you have plenty of time and energy to devote to it. The other option, which is significantly easier, is if your store is already on Shopify and you're already selling on the web on Shopify, um, within Shopify, you can link your store to Instagram and sell on Instagram. It's a few clicks. It's, there might be some troubleshooting, making sure product names match up properly. But for the most part, it's super, super easy. Um, my biggest recommendation, recommendation here, whether you decide to go and try selling on Instagram or not, is just ultimately be willing to test things. You know. Try selling on Instagram organically, try running some paid ads and see if it works. And if it doesn't, don't be afraid to, to redirect that effort towards just growing your Instagram page organically or growing through regular paid ads and then driving people through services like Linktree we mentioned earlier to get people to your store and buy that way. Ultimately, that's what we've ended up going with with some of our Spring Meadow um, D2C brands. And it's been more effective than trying to sell within Instagram.
Yeah, I think that's everything I have. Um, so if anyone has any questions for me, I know I kind of start to talk fast when I get real excited, which I do about, about analytics and paid ads and all those fun <laughs> things. So if we have any questions, I'd love to take them right now. Yeah, Joe, it looked like we did have um, a question come in for you. Um, Yvonne asks, is using Facebook suite to answer messages and questions from your posts on Facebook and Instagram considered engagement by these platforms or do we need to open the apps directly? Yeah, you can use the business suite. I would recommend it. It makes things organized and super easy to, to see and will ultimately make your life a lot easier. Um, the one thing I run into this issue, Christina might have a better answer specifically, but it is sometimes hard for me to tell if something's a DM or a post when I see it within the, the business manager side. So, you know, be aware if you're responding to a, to a DM or responding to a post um, and, you know, how you should answer based on that. So I'm also going to speak about that. Um, <laughs> so you can actually, um, you can answer in the business suite or you can just go, uh, if you manage both the Facebook and the Instagram, you can go Facebook um, and then any comments, you can actually, um, there's comments from Facebook and from Instagram and that is very clean, super easy to see if it's a comment on a post and you can just scroll um, through your Facebook post or your Instagram post and answer it right there. Um, I would recommend going to your phone um, on the app to answer Instagram questions because there are actually questions that don't make it to your inbox immediately because they are um, not from people that you've allowed to message. And I don't think those are shown on the business suite. That's my answer. <laughs> We had another, actually two more questions, but to the same um, effect. And this is probably for um, Susan or Christina. Um, talking about hashtags, um, and we talk about them a lot on Instagram, but is there value on um, hashtags on Facebook? Um, so I guess that answers that. But if anyone's uh, not looking know, at their computer, we got yeah, big head shakes. <laughs> it, looks, sorry, it looks no. out of date. Yeah, it looks out of date. Like, and it looks like you're um, cross posting, which is um, look is a sign of laziness on the side of the poster. Yeah. So, no. Still relevant on um, Twitter though, uh, but don't use that many. Maybe just try to do one or two maximum, but none right. on Facebook. You don't need 30 like you do on your Instagram post. No, people are not surfing <laughs> hashtags. Yeah. Um, can I, I saw one more question come in. Um, I think a couple of people asked it, but I don't think I answered it. It was about Instagram posts versus stories. This mm -hmm. is something we touched on on the first webinar. Um, then the question was, um, how do you know what to post on your pay, your profile page versus in your stories? Um, the way Proven Winners manages that is, um, we consider our profile page to be our permanent content, our evergreen content. So if someone wants to know what Proven Winners is all about, they can go to the Proven Winners page and see our posts. And those are um, more polished photos and um, show a broad array of products. And it kind of gives you the general overview of what Proven Winners is all about if you don't know us. Um, our stories, um, uh, how we use it, and how I recommend for garden center retailers is to use that for more in the moment kind of um, content and content that people don't need. Uh, it's, it's irrelevant a few days later. So if I was going to be posting about a 24 hour sale, I would do that in my Instagram stories, not in my posts, because that 24 hour sale will be irrelevant after the next 24 hours. And so you don't need that to be evergreen content on your page. Um, also your photos on your stories don't need to be as polished and they can be more, you know, I was walking down this aisle in our garden center and here's what struck me at this moment. And that's what I would put in my stories, um, uh, versus my profile posts. Great. And while you are answering that one, Susan, one other one popped up that said, um, should you follow everyone that follows you on Instagram? No, you should not. Um, you should follow people that um, post a lot about you and things that you like that you may want to um, share their content on your own page. Um, you will have everyone and their brother. If I followed 135,000 people back on Instagram um, in, my, in our feed, 
I would never see the kinds of content that I want to see when I go on Instagram, because when I go on our Instagram feed, I'm looking for content to share. Remember, that was part of the 75% ratio is 25% um, of that should be shared content. So when I'm going through our news feed, I want those who shows up in my news feed are the people I'm following. So I want to kind of qualify those people that I'm following. So when I am looking through my news feed, I'm finding good content um, to share and I'm finding and I'm seeing the posts of the people who really like us and post about us a lot because I want to make sure I'm interacting with those loyal fans. Great. Jess, I think that's it for questions. Great. Well, thank you all so much. That was just a ton of amazing information. I know everyone is super excited about the content that, that you brought up. And to kind of end the webinar, we wanted to talk about a few different ways that we as a brand can really support your efforts. And so um, I wanted to talk, and I know in some of our prior webinars, we talked a little bit about this Connect Plus program. And there's a URL on the screen that you can take a look at. But what we're really looking to do and our, our real goal at Proven Winners is, is to support you as an independent garden center and to help you to maximize your store visibility and really leverage the power of the brand and help you to leverage that at a very local level. And so Connect Plus offers a lot of social media support. Um, we have targeted Facebook and Pandora campaigns, um, video content, graphics, and a lot of additional information. But the beauty of the program is you can really buy in. Essentially, there's four options. There's a free option, so you don't have to pay anything. We offer a lot of, of free support. Um, but depending on what additional support you may need for your business, we have three pay for tiers. So basic, enhanced, and elite. And so you can select um, you know, as much or as little as you want from the brand. And, and our real goal is, you know, we understand that a lot of you are wearing a lot of different hats every single day. And so if we can support your efforts, if we can um, simplify that process for you as a brand, that's something that we're really looking forward and, and really would love to do for you. I talked a little bit about some of the free tools that we offer. Um, you know, Megan and I, especially during COVID and during the pandemic, knowing how busy you were, we really felt very strongly about offering a lot of free resources to our independent garden center customers. And so we created a Google Drive and, and there's a URL at the top of the screen. Um, quick reminder, we'll be recording the webinar. If you want these links, you can email Megan or I, you don't have to remember all of these uh, or write them down. Um, but this Google Drive has a ton of free social media graphics sized appropriately for both Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have great kids gardening projects. We have, you know, downloadable bench cards for free and a lot of additional information. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, we'd highly recommend you do that. Um, lots and lots of free resources there for you to take advantage of. So with that, we just want to sincerely thank you. We know your time is very valuable and we just want to thank our panelists because the knowledge that they shared with us so graciously today is just hugely helpful. And we hope that you found it helpful. Um, and on, on behalf of Megan, myself, and the entire Proven Winners organization, we just want to thank you for your support and your business. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email Megan or I. If you have questions for the panelists, uh, send them our way and we'll make sure that Christina, Susan, or Joe can answer those for you. So with that, thank you. Enjoy the afternoon. Thank you.